Well, we're about three, less than three weeks away from Rosh Hashanah, so it's a good time to be getting together to do some learning. There was a, a man who was suffering from severe melancholy. He was feeling really sad. And he went to this rabbi and said, Rabbi, I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm feeling so sad. And I've tried everything. And nothing's working. What should I do? I want, to, I, don't, I want to get out of this sadness. And the rabbi said, look, you know, I don't usually, I don't usually give this kind of advice, but considering the circumstances, I'm going to suggest you do something a bit out of the box. There's a, a nightclub in town, and every Thursday night they have a comedian, stand-up comedian. He's hilarious. He, He's so funny, he can bring people to tears. Even the saddest person can walk in and, you know, five minutes with this guy, he's roaring in laughter. Why don't you go this Thursday night, take a break from your routine and go see this comedian. Go see this, uh, this person, he can definitely cheer you up. He says, Rabbi, you don't understand, I am the comedian. <laughs> uh, sometimes our, our personas and our, our pursuits and our interests, our... You know, our routine, it's not working for us, even if it's, you know, even if our projection is, you know, working for everyone else. And Rosh Hashanah this time of the year is a time where we, we go through this journey of introspection, whether we like it or not. At each point in the Jewish calendar, there's a specific energy which we can tap into. And in that month of Adar, leading up to Purim, we experience joy. It's in the air. In the month of Av, we experience sadness. And in Elul, we're going through a process of self-discovery. And tonight we're going to focus on, on some components of that and also explore a little bit about the meaning of the shofar, about the, the ram's horn. And hopefully this class will serve as a way to give us a bit more meaning for those of us who would like to enhance our Rosh Hashanah experience, whether or not we're going to be in shul um, this year, which would be great if we all come. And there's still plenty of seats available. Menachem asked me to mention that. If anyone would like to come to Spiritual, we'd love to have you. But really, um, doing a bit of learning is the best way that we can really connect to the moment and make the most out of the 48 hours of Rosh Hashanah. And next week, we're going to be focusing on Yom Kippur. So I'd like to start with a, a parable, a very beautiful parable, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but... It's good to refresh it each year. And it's um, a parable that operates on many levels. Um, I've shared it with my, my three-year-old daughter several times, and she found it meaningful. And, um, you know, even telling it over, I do as well. So there's the king who has his only son, who's destined to be the heir of the throne. And as the king, with the power that he has and the wealth that he has and the opportunities that he has, he spares nothing to make sure that his son um, gets the most out of life, the best clothes, the best tutors, the best, uh, you know, the best uh, sports. Everything was perfect. His life was in within his bubble. Was you know the it was um, it was perfection, the epitome of perfection. But with that comes a great disadvantage, and that is that ultimately when the prince, who is destined to become the heir of the throne, needs to rule the people and resolve conflicts and negotiate boundaries and avoid war, etc., etc., if, no, if he has no experience with the outside world, how useful will he be to a kingdom which exists primarily outside of the walls of the palace? So with great reluctance, the king realizes and acknowledges that the only way he's going to truly educate his son after he's given his son everything is to send him out on his own and let him find his own way. And with a great sadness and hesitation, the king tells his son and says, look, it's time, you've got to leave. And he said, you can take whatever you can fit into one bag and whatever you can carry on your back and you need to go. Now, this king's son, imagine this child brought up in a sophisticated uh, palace with the finest tutors. He couldn't even speak the language of the people. You know, there was this polarity between, you know, the class system. Even his language 
He couldn't communicate with the commoners, you know, the peasants, the simpletons. He had to adapt his language. His dress made him look like an outsider with these beautiful robes. People were working in the fields, they were working in the taverns. They, they, they couldn't relate to him. And slowly but surely he shed his identity until he no longer looked like a prince at all. He looked like a, like a commoner, like anyone else. And the problem was that over time he actually forgot that he was a prince at all. He actually thought that he was a commoner. He was like everyone else. He, he, didn't have, he didn't maintain his unique identity. And he forgot the whole reason why he was sent out. It was not to become like everyone else, but to learn from everyone else and bring that wisdom back to the kingdom. Until one day, many years later, um, he notices that there's a whole commotion going on through the town square. And there he sees in the distance the royal carriage being, um, being paraded through the town, escorted by guards and horses and a whole entourage. And it reawakens in him, inside him the feeling of, wow, that's my father, that's my destiny, that's my throne, that's my, this is my life, this is who I am. And he, he reawakens this inside himself and he runs towards the guards and says, let me see my father. And they say, who are you? And he says... I'm the prince. So, well, you don't look like a prince. It's like, no, I'm the prince. So, well, you, don't, you don't sound like a prince. You can't even talk. You don't even have the royal dialect. They wouldn't let him near the king. They wouldn't have a bar of it. They would not let him approach the king. And he just, he couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe his predicament he was in. So, he didn't give up. He started chasing the carriage as it headed back towards the palace. And he gets to the entrance of the gates. He says, guards, don't you remember me? I grew up here. They thought he was crazy, and they wouldn't let him in. Um, and he's completely broken, and the gates of the palace close. And he lays down in the corner against the wall of the palace and starts crying and crying, Abba, Abba, just crying for his father. And through a window that was open in the corner of the palace, the sound of his crying slowly drifts up and catches his father's ear. And as soon as his father hears his son's voice, the crying, the simple cry, all the gates open up and he lets him in. They have that grand reunion. And this metaphor is representative of this time that we're in, the month of Elul, of a person, all of us are the prince who descend from a very high place. Our souls come from the spiritual realm with a specific mission in this world, and part of that is to discover what that mission is, our unique gifts, talents, whatever we have to share with the world. But somewhere along the way we get lost and we forget what we're doing here and we think that our purpose is to be like everyone else and to just become like the world instead of learn from it and give back to it. And this journey takes us so far away that when we're, when we're reunited with our destiny, it's almost as if we can't even... We're right there, but we can't even reach in and take it anymore. We can't even climb in. And that brings some kind of profound sense of, you know, some kind of existential feelings of loneliness or yearning. And it's from that place, that, that place of yearning, that place of darkness, where we can rise up again and sort of reclaim our throne and reclaim who we are and what we're meant to be. And that is the energy of El. It's about returning and coming back to what we always were meant to be. So in exploring the text which we're going to go into, um, which starts with this notion of teshuva, and here, unfortunately, they translate it as repentance, the most important thing to lay down at the outset is when we approach this topic, because we're going to be looking at things like sin and, and, and concepts like that, but we're going to reframe them, is that in Hebrew there's no such word as repentance. It doesn't translate. The word teshuva comes from the, the Hebrew root word hashev, which means return. And returning is a completely different concept from repentance. Returning implies I was somewhere, I left, I got lost, something happened to me, I need to get back. That's teshuva. That's this whole idea of teshuva in Judaism. It's about finding our way again. And once a year, we dedicate a certain amount of time to finding our way back home to where we need to get to. 
it's not about guilt, and it's it's not about um, um, feeling depressed and saddened about our state of loneliness or whatever. It's about figuring out how to get back to our equilibrium. So straight away when we hear this word teshuva, we have to take out this word repentance and replace it with returning. And all of a sudden it sounds like something that I might actually consider doing. I wouldn't really want to repent, but I may want to return. So teshuva means return. And tonight we're going to explore a little bit about this mechanism teshuva and also the place in which the shofar, this this beautiful um, ritual, musical instrument, takes the central role in in uh, teshuva. Um, yeah, there's not there aren't many instruments in Judaism, and shofar is basically one of the only ones. There's also the, the harp that King David used to play, but as far as the biblical instruments that we still have, the shofar is, is basically all, all we've got. And it's something that's very, very powerful. Um, and in the month of Elul, there's actually a custom to blow it every single day during the day. So at the end of the morning services, there's that, and you hear it, and you're kind of like, wow. Um, it's just a little taste. It's not the full extended Rosh Hashanah version, but it's just a little bit enough to say, wow, you know, where am I? What am I doing? Okay. So we're on. We're going to read from this text, and we're going to start from the page which is eighty-two and eighty-three. And this is a maimer. It's a Hasidic discourse, and it's written by the Reb Rashab, Reb Shalom Dalber Schneerson, who lived um, in the end of the eighteen hundreds, early nineteen hundreds, and he was dubbed the Maimonides of Hasidus the Rambam of Hasidut, because unlike the other Hasidic masters who like to write, if they would write at all, very brief and allow you to do the work and extrapolate it, he, like the Rambam, was very explanatory and really took people on a journey. So he would write, he wouldn't just teach orally, and in a year he would write volumes of books and really explain concepts in great depth. Um, and his mo- this comes from one of his most famous uh, books on on uh, Rosh Hashanah and it's it's a book about you know this this um, thick and it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages just explaining what Rosh Hashanah is so tonight we're just going to learn a few pages but you'll see it's quite comprehensive and I think that the reason I chose it is because we'll have I think one concept that we'll really really understand that will be able to hopefully be useful to us so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the Hebrew and the English and we'll explore and again, you know, this is an open it's an open class and if there's questions and comments we'll bring them in as long as they're relevant onto the topic at hand. Please feel free to interject and bring them in and we can discuss in this group. So I'm reading on 83 and you can follow if the Hebrew... Um, doesn't if you can't understand Hebrew, we can follow along in English. Vzehu gam kein inin hatshuva. This is the idea of teshuva, of this idea of returning. Shehat teshuva he bechinas his pailus atzmus hanefesh shelamayla mehatam vedas. Teshuva, in its most profound sense, involves an excitation of the soul's essence that transcends all reason and understanding. Ukumosha Kosov, as it's written in the verse, Mima Makim Korasicha Hashem, from the depths I call out to you, Mibichinas Oimek Pnimias Nekudas Alev, from the depths of the heart's innermost core. When we talk about the idea of Teshuva, we're not talking about an intellectual process. We're not talking about a person who's lost and needs a map, needs an, uh, a straightforward answer. We're talking about a very, very deep internal process, and it's a completely subjective experience. There's no one-size-fits-all to shuvah. It's a process that we have to go through. When we're talking about um, returning to and coming back to our senses and coming back to our spiritual identity, we're not talking about um, exploring 
like someone asked before about kashrut, is, is, a, is a tea bag kosher? There's a yes or no answer. It's very, very simple. There's no gray areas. We're talking about a journey that a person has to go on that's coming from a very, very deep place inside them. And what we've quoted here is a pasuk, a verse from Tehillim, from Psalms, which says, Mima makim Hashem, from the depths I call out to you. From the small place, from that, from that very deep place inside of us, that's where we're calling out to, to the divine. To Lachain, and therefore, B'makam Shabali Tshuva Oimdim, in a place where Bali Tshuva, people who go through this process of Tshuva, stand, Ein Sadikim Gemurim Yechoilim La'amoid, perfectly righteous individuals cannot stand. This statement comes from the Talmud. <clears throat> The majority of people come into a category which are called Bale Tshuva, which means people are going through a process of Tshuva, a process of returning. There are a few unique people in every generation which are called Sadikim, saints, perfectly righteous people. So in most you know, religious, um, you know, dogmatic, whatever, structures, the Tzadikim, the saints, are the heroes. They're the people who have all the wisdom, the inspiration. They are the on the highest spiritual platform. In Judaism, it's the opposite. The Talmud says, what we just read, that in the place which Bali Tshuva, people who are going through this process of change, where they stand, their spiritual status, a tzaddik, a perfectly righteous person, can never get to that place. And we're going to explain, we're going to explain why. To Kumoi HaHefrish Bavodis HaNashama, the difference explained earlier between the soul service when on high and its service below after being vested in a body. That's the same difference between the service or the work of a tzaddik versus the bal tshuva, the, the person who is going through a process of teshuva. Um, He's making reference to another discourse, which we're not going to learn tonight. But it's an important concept to understand. One of the questions that Kabbalah, one of the fundamental questions that Kabbalah comes to address is, what is the point of a soul coming into this world? The Kabbalah teachers gives us this imagery of there's this heaven, spiritual um, place where all the souls reside. And what are they doing while they're just in this heaven? They're basking in the glory of the Shekhinah. In other words, they're experiencing divine revelations. They're in this sublime bliss. They're enlightened, pure, literally enlightened. They're surrounded by divine light. They're just loving it. They're just basking in the glory of God. Um, blissing out. If anyone's ever had like some serious nachas before, if you've had this sense of achievement where you can just sit back and just enjoy it, enjoy the moment, nothing else exists in that moment, that would be a, you know, a grain of sand compared to the vast ocean of what these souls are experiencing. So why then take this soul, perfectly pure, and plunge it into this world, put it into a physical body, which is like a prison for a soul, and place temptation in front of it, and challenges, and all these relationships, and issues, and persecution, and all this stuff, you should have just left the souls up there. But no, Kabbalah explains, no. The purpose is down below. This is what's called the Tachlis HaKavona, to actually work with the darkness, to rectify the world, to make a difference in this low world. That's the whole purpose. That's what, that's what God wants. That's the, that's the divine plan. And as such, the souls which are basking in the glory over there and blissing out and enjoying that sublime revelation, they're actually not fulfilling the divine will to the same extent as us who are struggling out here in this physical world. Although, from looking on the outside perspective, they're on a very high spiritual level, practically speaking, in terms of fulfilling the divine will, they're not, they're not fulfilling the divine will in the same way. It's like imagine a father and he has his two sons and the father has a business that needs to be run and, but he has a lot of money. So one son is sitting in academia and he's like just out there in university. 
and he's just studying all day. And he's really, he's a real mensch. He doesn't do anything. He just sits in, he's a bookworm. He sits in the university. Everything's taken care of. I think, oh, this is nachas. This is what I want out of my son. And the other son is wheeling, dealing, and helping his dad and doing the whole thing. So you'd say, well, you're perfect, the son who's sitting in university. <coughs> but he isn't, because the father needs someone to be working, to be doing, to be working, to be doing the deals, to be making that difference. So even though his actions might seem uh, physical, coarse, you know, corporal, insignificant, whatever it is, the fact is, because he's expressing the divine will, he is fulfilling that divine will is on a higher spiritual nature. So the same contrast exists between the tzaddik, the perfectly righteous person, but as I mentioned, there's only a few in every generation, and in the beginning of Tanya, which is, which is the book written by the Alter Rebbe, the first Chabad Rebbe says, there's only a few tzaddikim, and you have to be born as a tzaddik, and when I was in yeshiva, one of the guys asked the question to the rabbi, well, how do I know if I was, maybe I'm a tzaddik, how do I know? He says, if you were a tzaddik, you'd know, you know, clearly <laughs> the fact that you're asking the question, you know, it's to be desired. But a tzaddik's job, a tzaddik's job is, um, has a different purpose in the world. And um, his role is not to struggle, doesn't struggle, and is considered to be perfectly righteous. And he has, plays a critical role for the Jewish people, for the world, but it's not the tachlis hakavana, it's not the ultimate purpose. Do you know any studies um, well, you know, it's like if a person, so <laughs> I don't, but other you? I know of some Sadiqim who have lived maybe in other generations, it's hard to know today, like, you know, firstly, we never know, that's the first thing, you know, you never know, and also there's this concept of, I know people heard about this, the 36 hidden Sadiqim, that in each generation there are 36 hidden Sadiqim, and maybe it's a you know, the street sweeper or the accountant from next door. Like, you won't, you never know kind of thing. You never know who's a, a true tzaddik. Um, and the Hasidic, you know, folklore, all the stories are full of these amazing stories about people who misjudged their neighbor or the guy living out in the forest. There's a beautiful story about, I'll never tell it next week, of Schwarz the Wolf, this guy who lived out in the forest who was the most, you know, the kind of like this recluse kind of... Um, I don't even know, like a hick living out there in the bush on his own, and he was really, truly hidden tzaddik. And in every generation, there were revealed tzaddikim as well. Um, it seems that right now, not just for the Jewish people, but for the whole world, we're in a leadership vacuum. You know, we have no, we have no one inspiring us. You know, we have no real leaders or tzaddikim. And um, in previous generations, I mean, certainly Lubavitcher Rebbe oh, was considered to be a tzaddik by 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 everyone, by the whole world. Um, he never said, hey, I'm a tzaddik, you know, that's not really how, probably not something that um, maybe a tzaddik would, would say, but um, I'm sure there are just today, it's, it's really hard to know. It's really hard to know. Um, it says that in the Talmud, it says that in the, in the generation before Mashiach, that the, the leaders of the people will be like dogs. That's what it says, like dogs. So that's pretty harsh, but what does it mean? Is that, you know, if you ever see, does anyone have a dog? Does anyone yeah. have a dog? Okay. <laughs> so when you walk your dog, when you're going walking your dog, so who's walking in front of you? The dog. The dog, right? Yeah. But every so often, it will turn around and, you know, just check and make sure that you're there. Mm. So it's, it's, the perception is, and if you look from the outside, the dog's leading the person, right? But he keeps looking over his shoulder to make sure, you know, what do you want? What do you need? What do you, can, can you re-elect me? Can you hire me? How can I, you know? And the leaders of today's generation are certainly, it's the, you don't have someone who can stand up and say, this is, my, this is my moral platform. These are my ethics. This is my code. You know, it's always like a dog. I'm leading, but I'm always looking behind me in order to get that affirmation that, you know, I'm taking you on the right direction where you want to go. Um, and the vision for a Jewish leadership is someone who can, it's not an autocracy, but it's, it's, it's someone who can, who can inspire the people, mobilize the people to reveal their potential, who they are, not the other way around. Um, anyway, um, <clears throat> so there's a contrast between the tzaddikim and bali tshuvas. But what we're saying is that a bal tshuva, who I think all of us would fit in that category, unless there's something I don't know about some people in this room. <laughs> That's right. Um, 
we we have a, a profound opportunity to be even on a higher level than a tzaddik. The avoidus ha tzaddikim who bechinas seid of a I'm in the middle of this um, second paragraph. The way in which a tzaddik, a, a saint, his divine service is through seid of a It's an order. It has a hierarchy. There's a process. It's very very clearly delineated because he's traveling one direction up, just transcending, going higher and higher and higher. He doesn't struggle and fall. He doesn't get tempted. There's no temptation. There's no um, downtime. He's just uh, constantly increasing in his holiness. So it's bechina seichel v'midas. It's in a, in, a, in a way of like mind and emotion. It's in a way of balance. We can look up to a tzaddik. He can give us advice. He can tell us about, our, uh, about what's going on inside of us, maybe what our tikkun is, what our particular calling is. And we can look at this person and say, wow, you're like a perfection of, of, a, human, of a human potential. But, as we all know, the void of the Baal Tshuva, the, so, the way we operate, we have to sometimes leap over barriers. It's not a unidirectional process. We'll try something and we'll, we'll fail, so maybe even several times, maybe even over and over again. But we have to keep keep on fighting and keep on trying and keep on transcending. And that's why so many, so often we get around to Rosh Hashanah or New Year's, you know, whatever is January 1st, and we're taking on these New Year's resolutions and then you look in your diary and like, oh, what was my last year's? It's the same as this year's, you know, here we are again, you know. And that's okay because that is our lot, that is our process, that's the thing that we have to go through, we have to keep on pushing ourselves to transcend ourselves. You can't be like, oh, I'm just going to keep on going. I've got to do something different, I've got to extend myself and that is, she megeder hakli legamri. We've got to completely leave the realm of boundaries. We've got to completely jump over. Bechinas hazavas kolatzmus etzem nefesh mamish. In a way that our entire being is moved from the essence of our soul. We have to go to that place where we can push on and say, find that deep, deep part inside of ourselves where I'm willing to, you know, take that extra hurl and, and push ourselves that extra further bit. And that explains, in part, why a Baal Tshuva, the, the person who's going through this process, is on a higher spiritual nature than a tzaddik, is because he has to access, he or she has to access that part of their being. A tzaddik doesn't have to, he's following the process. Born a tzaddik and just transcending. A Baal Tshuva keeps falling, we keep stumbling, we keep losing our way. So we have to go deeper and deeper and deeper and find those deeper resources inside ourselves in order to carry on. Another way of putting it is there's this idea that there's two kinds of light, two kinds of way a person can receive light. There's Or Yashar, which is a straight light, and Or Choyzer, which is like the rebound, the reflection. It's kind of like a person who learns something the easy way and the hard way. The easy way is when you're 12 years old and your parents sit down and give you the talk and tell you, you know, all the things that they've learned and you know, how you should leave your, lead your life. And then, you know, the very small percentage of people are like, oh, okay, I'll follow you. And they just sort of go down that path and they settle down and do the right thing and blah, 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 and live a very normal and boring existence. And then there's everyone else who's like, oh, but I want to... I want to figure it out for myself. I'm going to throw everything out the window and I'm going to get beaten up and I'm going to get wasted and in the, in the wrong crowd and go, go buy a bad investment and end up in a bad relationship and get robbed and, you know, everything's going to... All these things are going to happen. But, you know, when, when you turn 40, when you have that 40th, you know, anniversary or, you know, in my case, I'm a bit younger, but when you meet people, you know, 10 years later and you see whatever... You know, who's got the wisdom? Who's got the understanding? Who's got the depth of experience? Who's, who, who's got the, the tools to handle when the punches don't exactly throw the way you want it? It's not the person who just went the or, yashar, the straight, the straight and narrow. It's the people who had to learn the hard way and had to learn through experience. But when you know something then, it's like, now I know it. <laughs> I really, truly know. I don't know because I've read in a book. I know it because I've been there. I've, I've, I've done it. That's it. So that's what we're talking about here. That's a Baal Tshuva. And spiritually works out even, even something more amazing. Spiritually what we're saying is that, that a Baal Tshuva can, through the, going through the process of Tshuva, can actually rectify 
elements of, of, of their past, which a tzaddik could never even dream of doing. I'll give you an example. It's like, um, it's this spiritual mechanism which says that when you go through a process of teshuva, everything you've done until that point becomes, in a sense, it becomes meaningful, becomes part of that journey. And as such, it becomes elevated. So we know there's certain things Judaism ascribes for no specific reason, like we're talking about kosher before, I'll use that as a perfect example. Kosher means fit, and treif, or non-kosher, or tame means unfit. You know, it doesn't mean it's evil, it doesn't mean it doesn't taste good, it just means that we can't have it. Okay, so the Talmud says, you know, should we say, should a person say that um, non-kosher food, whatever, you know, pig, or bacon, whatever it is, tastes terrible, it's, it's a horrible thing? No, I should say, it's delicious, it comes from God, it's unbelievable, I just can't have it, right? Now, Zadik is never going to have it because he's perfectly righteous, he's going to listen to his parents, right? He's going to do the right thing. But a Balchuvah will say, hey, come on, how bad is it really? And get into, get into it. Now, when they go through that process of tshuva later on, this can't be premeditated. I'm not here condoning, you know, <laughs> going out there and doing all this stuff. But in hindsight, when you go through that process of tshuva, so what comes out? That all the experiences that led up to this moment in time were essential for me to go through this process of change. In other words, if I didn't meet that guy, and I didn't go here, and didn't blah, 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 then I wouldn't be who I am today, right? So when I've actually then taken that leap and transcended myself and, and activated the depths of my being and said, who am I really and what do I want and made those decisions, all the things I've done up to in that point, it's not like they get excused, pardon your pardon for your sins. No, they become part of your journey. They become elevated. So you've taken things which are unkosher, unfit, impossible to elevate, and you've done the impossible. You've done it. You've elevated it. A tzaddik can only work with what is permissible. A tzaddik can say, right, I can learn X amount of Torah. I can do X amount of mitzvahs. I can shake a lulav so many times and put on tefillin so many times. But I can never take a Big Mac and make it holy. But a Baal Tshuva can do that. A Baal Tshuva can do that. A Baal Tshuva can do things, can take his past, his or her past. We can take our experiences and allow them to become meaningful by going through a process of tshuva, by realizing that we had to go through certain things in order to go deeper within ourselves. It's a very, very, very profound teaching. It's very radical. It's also very dangerous. That's why I put the disclaimer. By no means should we go and find the dodgiest thing that we can do in the whole world. I mean, next to Rosh Hashanah, say, look how amazing I am. I've just elevated the darkest parts of the universe. And the reason I say that is because Shabtai Tzvi, who was the, the false messiah who lived in the end of the 1700s, that's the kind of thing he was doing. He was using Kabbalah to justify um, his very radical spiritual journey, which ended up in a disaster, where he was saying, you know, we have to go into the darkness and try and elevate it. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about this thing in Hebrew, it's called Bidi Eved, after the fact. After the fact, what do we do now? In another context, this idea of Bidi Eved is like this. Like, for example, let's say we're cooking a big, uh, big soup for, for Friday night at Spirit Grow, and um, there's going to be 100 people at Shul, big chicken soup, and uh, we're just having a chat in the kitchen, and someone has a cup of coffee, and a little bit spills into the big pot. Mm. Now, what do you do then? So there's a, there's a, um, a process. One si- yeah, it's this idea of bottle of shishim, if there's 60 times the amount. But it, just, it depends whether it gives taste or not. There's a, there's a whole criterion to discern whether or not it's okay. So then if you're an innovative chef, you could think, right, well, if I get one little bit of cream and a nice chicken soup, then that, I could get, find the loophole and make it kosher, right? Mm-hmm. Wrong. It's only bidi evid. It's only after the fact. You can't do it lechad chila if you do it. In the first instance, you can't eat the whole thing. So what we're talking about is looking backwards and then looking forwards. So tshuva is about returning again. So it's about going through that process and finding meaning and then using those events as a springboard to go forward. Um, the other metaphor that Hasidut brings for this, which, which fits very nicely, is this idea of the, of, the, um, of the bow and arrow, whoever's done archery before, you need to bring it, pull it in, in other words, away from the target to create the tension in order to propel it forward. So we're going inwards deep in order to be able to extend forward. So let's carry on here. We're on the third paragraph. 
Shizehu, that this is Mima Makim Kar We mentioned this verse which says, From the depths I call out to you. What is, it, what is this verse talking about? Bechinas Oimek Pnimius Nefashe Chulu. We're really talking about going to the soul's innermost core. Vayidezeh, and through this, Kar I'm able to call the Bechinas Pnimius Ve'atzmus Ein Soif Baruch By going deep within myself and calling on my own, the depth of my own being, this allows us to go deeper in our relationship with, with Hashem, with the Divine, and say, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm not, it's not going to cut it to have this sort of surface level relationship with God where everything's just cruisy. I'm going to, I want to extend myself, I want to go deeper, I want to um, throw myself into the deep end and, and allow myself to experience some very, very lofty things. And this idea, this, this process, again, of like being able to rectify the past and and turn something which was um, not kosher, in other words, untouchable, and make it holy, is an example of going into probing the very depth or the very um, profound nature of godliness, which is that the truth is that, you know, there's this certain sense of oneness where everything's interconnected, and that's how it's possible to elevate those, those things, those untouchables. Okay. So now, the next paragraph we're going to explain, we're going to further explore this idea more in the, in the text. Before we go there, though, I just want to clear something up. Um, sorry, just had to refer to the notes here. Yeah. Um, okay, so we know that Rosh Hashanah is the Jewish New Year. So that would imply that it's the first day of the Jewish New Year, like the equivalent Lahavdil of, you know, January 1st in the secular calendar. However, our sages teach us that Rosh Hashanah is actually the sixth day of the of the year. The world was created on Chof, Chof Hei Elul, on the 25th day of Elul. And Rosh Hashanah is the sixth day. So the first of Tishrei is six days later. So the question the sages ask is, well, if the whole point of Rosh Hashanah is to acknowledge and celebrate the Jewish New Year, wouldn't it make sense that we should celebrate that in the first day of creation? But no, we celebrate in the sixth day of creation. And the reason for that is, the reason given is because the sixth day of creation, that was the day that mankind was created. So, um, a sages say, why was man, mankind, created on the sixth day? Surely mankind should have been... We are the center of the universe, right? We are the, the ultimate purpose of the universe. So surely we should have been created on the first day, the most important. So they give two reasons. It's very interesting, like a contrasting reason. On the one hand, we say the reason mankind was created on the sixth day is because we want people to acknowledge and have humility that even a mosquito preceded you in creation. Even the lowly, the lowliest of all creatures, the little mosquito, preceded you. But on the other hand, it's, it's, the, it's a way of saying that the whole world has been prepared for you. It's like setting the whole table, setting everything up and saying, here, this is your world, this is your playground. Let's see what you make out of it. It's all there ready for us. And that's echoed in um, the group of Hasidim. There was a practice to walk around with two pieces of paper, one in each pocket. And on one it was written, I'm naught and nothing, I'm dust and ashes, I'm going to return to the dust. And on the other, in the other pocket it had a piece of paper which, which was written another saying, which is that the whole world was created only for me. And the idea is that both those statements have to be true at, at every single moment. That on the one hand, we're nothing, even a mosquito preceded us. We have to have a profound sense of humility. Who are you already? What are we? We're just, you know, we're nothing. But on the other hand, it's all been set up. Here it is. I'm giving you the whole universe, the whole world. Let's see what you make out of it. So therefore, Rosh Hashanah is not on the first day of creation because that's, that's, there was nothing happening yet, really. It's about saying, it's about Hashem reaffirming His faith in us and saying, you know, I've given this whole world to you and I want to see what you can make out of it, what you can do with it, what, what change you can influence. Um, yeah. 
So let's let's bring a focus back into this um, page eighty two, last paragraph, and page eighty three in the in the Hebrew, the fourth paragraph. So all of this, this whole process, we're talking about something very deep, and it sounds very nice that we have to get to the the core and the innermost, uh, you know, the, the the deepest part of our being. It sounds very new age and very very inspiring. But the question is, how do you actually do it practically? Becholze, how do we do this? Nase, it's done. Dafka aliyde hametzer shemina hefech, specifically through the distress that comes from the opposite opposite of holiness. Shahari mikoidem hoisen nefashik shura v'tuma de klipas noga, because previously the soul was bound with the impurity of klipat noga, of one level of impurity. With salmoves v'rag gomu, with darkness, with the shadow of death, with complete evil. But when the bitterness of his spirit stirs him to leave the darkness, that is when a person is greatly pained by the enormity of all the things that they've done that literally afflict their soul. From there, so a person will be moved to to crying, to be crying loud, bitter cries and weeping and fasting. Now, this sounds very doom and gloom, um, and that's why I wanted to try and reframe some of this. There's kind of two. Again, I'm talking a lot about you know two kind of two perspectives, contrasting two perspectives. But I think there's a a similar theme running through them. There's a notion, and it's found in, in, in the Talmud and in, in the sources, rabbinic literature, that the reason people will do mitzvot, do good deeds, is to earn spiritual brownie points in the world to come. And the reason that they w- will not sin is in order to avoid purgatory, in order to avoid hell. Okay, So... If you have little kids, like I do, that sounds very familiar, reward and punishment. It's a basic, very basic part of human psychology, and it works very well. The problem is that as soon as a child becomes a little bit bigger and more powerful, they're not interested in that. They need some meaning. They need a bit of a meaningful um, process. Now, I think the same is true with this idea of mitzvot, of good deeds and sins, you know, this kind of thing in Judaism. Where, where is it leading us? So most of us... The notion of a world to come and the notion of hell is, it's, it's meaningless. And that's why Kabbalah and Hasidut reframe the thing entirely. And let's extend this parable of the child with the parent. When the child becomes a little bit, a little bit older and the parent wants to, let's say, inspire or motivate the child to do something, you can't reward him with uh, lollies or with a, a convertible or whatever, a holiday to, to Thailand. That's not enough to want the ch- for the child to want to, you know, um, let's say, do the will of the parent. It's not what the child wants to do. The child, if he's maturing and evolving and the relationship is evolving, said, I want this relationship. So the reason I'm not doing this is not because you're going to give me something or take something away from me. It's because I don't want to hurt you. We're in a relationship. We care about each other. We love each other. It's a give and take. So it's not... There may be reward and punishment. There may be consequences. We're not negating that, but it's not about that. That's not the focus. That zooms out, that goes into the backdrop. might be true, but it's, it's irrelevant. What's relevant here is a relationship. So you have people who, you know, might cheat in a relationship and really are going to try and make sure not to get caught because they're worried about what's going to happen to them. They're people who won't do something because they don't want to hurt the other person. Um, They don't want to put the relationship at risk. And that's what this is referring to. And that's what, when we talk about sin and distance and punishment in... in, We didn't even mention punishment here because we're, we're not concerned with it. We're talking about a relationship. So, if you, if you, if, in other words, if our Judaism is meaningful for us, we have a relationship, we feel we have a relationship with the divine, and then we come to an acknowledgement that really I'm really far away from where I wanted to be, and like how did I end up here, and what am I 
do I really want to be doing these things, etc.? And I feel that distance, it's painful. It's like it's hurtful. It's like I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to distance myself from you. Just like we could imagine in a relationship. I didn't want to have that fight. I didn't want to... You asked me not to do that. Why did I go and do it anyway? Why didn't I just have a bit of self-control, you know? So that's what we're talking about here. And when we have that distance, that distance, that very, you know, that very act of betrayal, that creates a tension which allows us to go then and reaffirm our connection. And that, that itself is powerful in, in having the motivation to be able to connect again. So that's why it says, again, the verse, Min ha from the depths karasikai call out to you. We can call out the deepest, the strongest, when we're far away. It's like that, you know, absence ma- makes the heart grow fonder. When you're away from something, you feel how much you miss it. And it's true. It's really, really true. You know, if you, if you need to have a break, if you want to decide how you feel about something or someone, and you have a little break, that can be the most telltale, tell, telling sign, you know. Um, when I went to Yeshiva, I had a really, my really close friend, and he, he had been going out with his girlfriend for many years, back and forth and finding it. They wanted to get engaged, they didn't know, and he, he's like, that's it, you know, let's just see. So he went to Israel for a couple of months to learn in Yeshiva. He didn't last a couple of months, it was like two weeks later, they came back and that was it, they got engaged. It, really, it affirmed everything, the distance created the love again, and that's what they needed to reaffirm it. So that's this idea of this Minha Metza, from the depths I call out to you. And we read this verse before we blow from the shofar. And the interesting thing is the shofar itself is a metaphor for, as we mentioned at the beginning of the story, of the person crying out. But even the actual shofar, the actual physical shape of the shofar is representative of this. If you look at the shofar next time you're at Shul, Rosh Hashanah, so there's a very, very small mouthpiece. And then it opens up to this, you know, it just sort of funnels through and then all of a sudden opens up. Min from the depths, from the narrows, from the constraints, from that little space, the great sound can be heard, that great volume, the great things that can be done from a very, very small space. And actually, if you try and blow the shofar from the other way, it doesn't work, right? Mm-hmm. So you need to have that small mouthpiece to create a very powerful sound. It's the tension, the air going to that small space. So even the shofar, which is producing the sound, which elicits the response, which creates the very shofar itself, the physical shofar, is representative of that metaphor, which I think is really, really profound in itself. So, <clears throat> that a person is pained by his distance, by the things that he's done. Specifically, because we're in pain, because you feel the distance, that's how you can activate your your um, your depths. And that is Bibachinas Tsaaka Pshuta, the level of just a simple cry. Shahatsaaka Yotse Mikora Salev Mamish, that the cry comes from the depths of the heart. What's crying? Crying is the inability to express our thoughts and feelings. That's why babies cry all the time. They can't talk. That's why when we get very emotional, um, which doesn't happen to us blokes too often, but if it did, you'd know something was happening. If you're crying, and it's, you know, when it happens, and you know, it's very, very, very profound. It's like, whoa, I can't, it's, I'm having such a deep experience. There's nothing I can say to express it. This is so real. This is me. I'm raw. I'm exposed. That's why people don't want to cry in front of other people. Oh, I can't, I'm so embarrassed. I'm crying. Why are you crying? Why are you embarrassed? What's the big deal? It's just some saline coming out of your tear, duct, tear ducts. What is it? Because it's a physical response which is making me extremely vulnerable, I'm completely exposed. The tears are showing the depths of... I'm bearing my soul in front of you, you know? And that's, you know, people feel like sometimes it's a common thing where when you're in distress and then you might break down in front of a complete stranger. I can't believe I'm doing this to you. You're crying in front of a stranger because it's more comfortable to cry in front of someone you don't know as they're more likely to accept you than have to do it with someone that you're really close with where then you'll have to deal with it afterwards. So people cry like a supermarket, you know, when they're totally overwhelmed. <laughs> it's a real thing because that, that can be a place we can have that catharsis, you know, like a... So I, I'm conscious of the time, but <clears throat> I think we'll... This is an amazing story here that he finishes with. V'kamoi Rabbi Eloza ben Durdaya Shiyotze nishmasi bebechia Like this man, Rabbi Eloza ben Durdaya, whose soul left his body with crying. Now, 
He doesn't mention the story, but in the footnote, it's brought down the story from the Talmud. This man, Rebbe Lazar ben Judea, was known to be a bit of a playboy, you could say. It says there was no harlot that he didn't know. So he was really not exactly a um, well-behaved gentleman. And there was one particular instance where... Um, you can see it in the note here. I'm just going to read out so I get the exact wording. That um, there was one certain harlot, a prostitute, who said a breath blew out of her mouth, so she just exclaimed, just as the wind will never return to its place, likewise, Rabbi Lozaben, Durdaya's repentance will never be accepted. So a person, this person who strayed so far, as he's a no-hoper, is gone, the situation is gone. When he heard that, so when she said that basically he's, he's, he's got nothing to give, that moved him so deeply that he, um, he began to ask the heavens and the earth and the moon and the stars, will my repentance be accepted? And everyone was saying no. And finally he broke down crying with such a profound truth and yearning that at that moment his, his teshuva, his repentance was accepted and he just returned, his soul returned to its creator. That was it. Like, that's his, he'd finished his life's purpose. And at that moment, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi was crying. Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi was the author of the Mishnah, so he was w- one of the greatest sages of all time and said, you know, some people can work their whole life of what he achieved in one moment with a cry, with just that sincerity and that truth. Um, and what was the impetus for that, for his process of returning? was someone saying, you've got, there's no hope for you. And that pushed him. He said, no, I, I've never felt more... F- it's like when someone dares you to do something, but he never felt so far away in his whole life. And that moved him so deeply that he had to find that deep, deep, deep place inside of himself where he was able to come back to and, and return. And that actually ended up, um, on the rare occasion, that, it, that it's, I'm, I'm sure it's actually physically possible that he actually his soul left his body and that was the end of his life. It was such a powerful, you know, life-shattering moment. Sure. Would you call that a curse? Did she curse him? Yeah, when I was reading the story today, I was thinking about that. Like, what was she really acknowledging? I think, I think she was just sort of... I mean, if you think about... And without being judgmental about the kind of business that she was in, she was not exactly uh, a saint herself. Mm. And um, I think she was just acknowledging the situation, like this is what it is. Like this is the kind of person he is, just saying it, a statement, you know, like... So it was not a I don't think it was inspired. No, like, like you're never going to... And, and you see it in the simile, like just as the wind will never return to its place. It's mm. not a curse, it's a statement of fact. Mm. It's, impos- it's an impossibility. And... To him, that was something that sort of hit home. You know, it wasn't a curse; it was like well, maybe a challenge. Truth, perhaps that he saw contained within the pronouncement. That's right. He conf- like confronting himself, like that story with the comedians. You know, mm. like it's it's so deep, like it's funny, but it's really really deep. Like saying, you know, this is it's like there's nowhere else to look anymore. And he'd been chasing pleasure his whole life, and then he'd been reduced to nothing, literally, like. It's basically saying that he has no. Um, he diminished him. Yeah, he had diminished no. Um, being diminished his soul. That's it. He was nothing. He had nothing left to contribute. So, in other words, he's not even a person anymore. Because, because we, absolutely a hundred percent. This is the, the cornerstone of our religion is the absolute belief in humanity, to triumph, to to be able to find good in all situations, and that that that's our defining quality as human beings. And she took that away from him. She said, no, nah, you cannot. You cannot change. So he, so he had that moment where his soul left his body. And it's really, really powerful. And if we experience just a little, little, little part of that. And teshuva, by the way, is not like we're talking about, you know, teshuva, this process of returning to ourselves. So it's in all aspects. It's not just saying, okay, um within our Jewish practice, but also within our being, within our psyche, within our consciousness, with, with, with who we are, with how we present ourselves. It's a reckoning. It's a, it's, a, it's a way that we can 
we can look into a mirror. That's the whole point of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And going through that process once a year in this environment, in a safe environment, in a place where we, we allocate that time, we're not beating ourselves up every day of the year and saying, oh, I could do better. It's not about it. We've got to, there's things we need to do, right? But once a year in this time, we can go through that reflective journey and that um, actually informs the following year and what kind of year we're going to have. So I think perhaps I was a bit amb- ambitious with how much we would get through <laughs> tonight, but this is really, um, I guess, to summarize that what we explored tonight is this idea of teshuva and the idea that we are not sadikim to the best of our knowledge, and we should be happy about that because in it, it brings great opportunities to be able to um, not feel remorse about our past, but use our past to springboard towards going to a deeper place and allowing us to really get in touch with who we really are and, and have a look in the mirror once, once a year and say, hey, what do I have? Like, what can I bring? And when we, when we don't like what we see, instead of feeling guilt and sadness, say, wow, I don't like that. Let me use that tension. Let me use that dislike in order to find what I really want to have and what I really want to give. Um, so acknowledging those feelings of like, oh, whoa, I'm not, I'm not where I want to be. That's good. Let's use that and just and, and, and push on with that. So let's, um, let's finish with a nigun to internalize this. I'm going to sing a nigun tonight. Um, we're going to sing it over the high holy days, so we get into the spirit. I didn't bring a shofar. We don't usually blow shofar at night. But this, this nigun is a, a beautiful nigun that we sing... Um, uh, on the in the evening service over the high the high holy days. Oh, 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 Yeah, yeah.